started then um, folks can join us when they join us. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it, uh, especially for those who are in time zones where it's very early or, or very late. Um, and thank you, of course, so much, uh, Dr. Franks, for, for joining us as well. It's such a, such a pleasure to have you, genuinely, um, and to hear your professional insights on, on Chihuahuas before we started also. Um, so this month, we're really, really happy to have our third um, Effective Aquatic uh, Animal Advocacy webinar. Um, originally, we had uh, Dr. Lynn Snedden and then Professor Kathy Kessler, and now we have Dr. Becca Franks, and we're just so, so happy and so grateful that we've had such a, such a stacked lineup. Um, so a little bit more about um, Dr. Franks for those of you who, who don't know too much about her work yet. And Becca Franks is a research scientist and professor um, at the Environmental Studies Department at New York University, which has a really, really incredible multidisciplinary um, animal studies program. Um, at NYU, uh, Becca studies and teaches on issues related to um, animal protection, specializing in the well-being of aquatic organisms. Becca holds a doctoral degree in psychology from Columbia University and a Killiam Postdoctoral Research Fellowship in Animal Welfare from the University of British Columbia, which is just a mile away from where I am right now in Vancouver, BC. Professor Frank's work uh, bridges really, really diverse fields, so psychology, animal welfare, animal studies, behavioral ecology, environmental science, uh, with the goal of further strengthening um, animal protection causes through whether that's legislation um, and other forms of advocacy efforts. So thank you so much, um, Becca, for being with us. I'm really excited for your presentation. Um, we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to um, put some questions in the chat as they pop up. And otherwise, thanks, Becca. Great, thank you so much. This is so exciting to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really an honor to be able to talk to you all. Um, and taking time out of your Saturday to um, listen to the work that I've been doing with my colleagues on fish welfare. Um, so we have about an hour for the whole event, right, Becky? Okay. Yeah, that's right. So feel free to, um, you know, anywhere between, I think, 30, 45, 50 minutes would be fine. Um, I'll also take this opportunity to add one more thing that I neglected to say about Becca, probably because it's a little early for me here too, which is that Becca's work was really foundational to the um, establishment of Aquatic Life Institute and Becca, we're so happy to have her um, in working with us on our board and, and working with her closely. So also wanted to make sure folks uh, folks knew just how foundational her work was for, for everything we do. So wanted to put that little plug in there. And um, yeah, Becca, about 10, about, uh, 10 hours, I was gonna say, about one hour in total. <laughs> 10 hour presentation from Becca Frank, so about one hour in total, so anywhere between 30 and 50 minutes is great. Yeah, unfortunately I probably could talk for 10 hours about these issues, but uh, I'll limit myself to a fraction of that. Um, okay, so I will share my screen now. Um, so can you see this now? Okay, great. Um, so I think the original title of the event was uh, Positive Welfare for Fish, and I've changed it to Fish's First Fish Welfare, which is kind of a tongue twister. So uh, I think it might be a fun game that you can challenge your loved ones to, to say Fish's First Fish Welfare uh, three times fast. And then it can be a segue into talking to them about why fish matter. Um, so just a little. Uh, strategic ploy there. Um, yeah, so I will explain uh, what what I mean by fish's first fish welfare towards the end of the talk. Um, uh, but I will start by thanking uh, funders and collaborators. Uh, all of this work is very collaborative and very um, uh, uh, made possible by really generous uh, people and foundations who have supported the work all the way along. Um, so first, I would like to talk about some fish facts to make sure we're all on the same page. And, and, you know, I've been working on fish for, you know, several years now, and it's still, things are still, basic fish facts are still dawning on me. And in preparing this presentation, there's some core issues 
that even though we sort of all know, I'm just appreciating on these new levels. So I wanna, wanna talk about that first to set the stage of who we're talking about. Um, then go into a specific case of aquaculture and what's happening in aquaculture today. Um, and then tell you what I mean by fish is first fish welfare. Okay, so starting with fish facts. Um, so thinking about fish uh, globally, um, we know that a, over a hundred billion probably around there are farmed each year. There's hundreds of millions in homes. There's tens of millions in laboratories around the world. They're um, now surpassing mice as the most popular animal model for um, diseases and genetic development and et cetera. And then there's trillions in the wild that are hunted and facing the sixth mass extinction. So there's a massive global extinction event going on where we're seeing huge numbers of species um, going extinct due to human activity. Um, and fishes uh, in the wild are certainly uh, very, very susceptible to this pattern. Um, and then they're being hunted. It's really actually hunting. You know, these fisheries that go out, it's the last uh, like uh, human, um, full-blown human hunting event is happening in the oceans and fishes are very affected by that. I'd like to say that issues around their sentience and questions around their pain are uh, in the past. There are a few holdouts. Um, so we recently published a, a, a history of the fish pain debate um, and uh, you know what happens when scientists get hooked on a question that could be argued forever, tracing the human history of this debate. And it's really this pernicious question that keeps coming up. And so if you're curious about the history of it, and how that debate has um, been shaped by you know, human values rather than anything actually to do about fish. Um, I'd recommend checking out this article. I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. Um, but I, what I do wanna talk about is our perception of fishes in contrast to who fishes are. So I think our perception of fishes can be summarized as we think of them as being primitive, lesser than, and inferior, just in general. Um, and this is grounded and founded in this um, ancient view of the ordering of the uh, beings on earth uh, in this Scala Naturae, the great chain of being that dates back to at least the great ancient Greeks, with the idea that you have God at the top and then the angels and then man and then women and then various other forms of subhuman going all the way down you know, through different animal species to plants, to um, rocks and stuff like that. So we see this simple version of fish. So this paper that came out in PNAS in 2013 was saying like, no, this is not the right way to think about the world. We need a modern theory for the way, you know, how to think about the relationship between animals. And so what's changed here, as far as I can tell, is that now some of the other animal groups have more blobs um, those blobs are supposed to be parts of the brain. And then uh, now there's sort of like a looping branching away from the ladder. But it's still, I mean, it's undeniably still a ladder. And undeniably, you know, humans have the biggest, you know, biggest red blob. Um, it's still very, very human centric. And it's, it's just actually not this visualization of evolution is completely incorrect. We actually know this. This is not controversial. And it's not even particularly modern. So this is some of my favorite marginal marginalia. This is Darwin developing the theory of evolution and scribbling in his notebook on the side. And he writes, I think, and then he has this branching tree. And when he, when we talk about a tree of life, if we look back to Darwin, this is what he was thinking and it still it kind of gives me chills because he had this idea um, centuries ago and this was his insight and we're still struggling to fully understand the depth and the importance of of this perspective we're still stuck in this scala naturae great chain of being version of um uh, of thinking about uh, our relationship, uh, evolutionary biological relationship to other animals on the planet. And it's not grounded in evolutionary theory, even going
going back to Darwin, um, but it's hard to shake. So this is what just occurred to me, is, is if we think about our family tree and we've got siblings and cousins and second cousins and we can think about our grandparents and great grandparents, fish are not our great grandparents. They are our second cousins. So imagine that you met somebody and you find out that you're, they're your second cousin. And just because, you know, in finding that out, you realize, oh, we share a com common ancestor. That's not, that doesn't mean my, that person is my, com my ancestor. They're my second cousin. And if you said something to them like, oh, we share a common ancestor. You're so primitive and inferior to me. Like, it's, just, it's, it's like, it's crazy. It's just not accurate. And it's, you know, brood, frankly. Um, and so fish are not our great grandparents. Just because we share a common ancestor with them doesn't mean that they are primitive to us. They are our second cousins. So a better representation of this, like a true biology of fishes, is, is represented in this um, paper that came out in 2019, and they were looking at some um, evolutionary uh, selection events in sharks. And I really love this um, diagram. Uh, because it, you know, it's just got all of these different fish on it, and then this like little like side note of the humans and where we came from. So this is this is uh, our lineage as uh, humans, as tetrapods, goes back, you know, over 400 million years, um, where we branched off from the lobe fin fishes. Uh, now there's a modern lobe fin fish called a coelacanth uh, that uh, was discovered a few decades ago. Um, so we branched off from them. Then there's another branching event that actually occurred more recently in time. So this is way after we branched off from uh, the most recent common ancestor that we shared with fish. And this branching event is really important because it um, produced the teleosts. And the teleosts are the largest group of fish on the planet today. So about 95 to 98% of the species of creatures that we call fish are teleosts. So, and that's about 30,000 different species of fish. The vast majority of them are teleosts. There's a huge diversification and radiation event that happened later in evolutionary history after we split off from a last common ancestor to produce the teleosts. And then you have to go back even further, more than 500 million years ago, to to think about when the sharks then branched off, and the sharks in, in this paper is quite interesting. You know, sharks are also thought of being even more primitive than the regular kind of fish. And uh, that, of course, is also not true. There was many positive selection events. That's what those PSs are, is like identifying genetic markers of positive selection events that happened. And then so the sharks also had different things happening in their evolutionary history and diversification so that you get these different forms of shark that are alive today, like the elephant shark, the whale shark, and the great white shark. So there's no sense in thinking about this multitude of animals as being primitive, ancestral, or inferior to us. They're modern, they're our, our second cousins and beyond. And then the other thing that we tend to do is we look at this huge diversity, which you'll note also isn't biologically coherent because we sort of cleave ourselves off and then lump together um, this whole group. Um, so it's not biologically sound to actually even do that, but we do. So we call them all fishes. And then we have this generic notion of a fish, uh, which is, you know, that's just incorrect also. Um, so even on that branching tree, not only were fish at the bottom, they were represented as like a singular thing in contrast to birds and lizards. And, you know, that's just not, that's not accurate. So if you were a fish and you were creating an evolutionary tree, you might make something like this. Um, and in this case, the most, uh, most evolved, most selected for uh, creature is the puffer fish. So that's all the way at the right here. And we can imagine that maybe a puffer fish made this. And so that's really important. I want to call your attention to this, this, uh, this uh, group. Um, so there was a selection event, this diverse, divergence that happened um uh, and uh, you know hundreds of millions of years ago and then all of these fish have this modern invention this modern uh, uh 
specialized characteristics that they share, which then also uh, continued to diversify. But this crucial event was the evolution of the swim bladder as a specialized organ that allows fishes to maintain their buoyancy without constantly swimming. So it's like a real, like, it's an advantage to have a swim bladder. You don't have to spend as much energy swimming all the time to keep your, your um, position in the water column. Um, and so, you know, these other fish on the left here, the primitive fishes don't have this specialized organ. Um, and you'll notice that in that lumping here, we have the low fin fishes and the tetrapods. So that's us. So a fish could be looking at us and say, you know, they're so primitive, they have lungs. So the organ that the swim bladder evolved from was a lung. The last common ancestor in this branching event, I don't think you can see my mouse, but it's below this green block here. That last common ancestor had lungs. So, you know, the fish could, the puffer fish could be looking at us and be like, oh, they have that primitive structure that's so useless. They can't even maintain their buoyancy in the water column. Um, of course, they had to like get out of the water. They're so like bad at it. Um, so, you know, this is not to say that this is more accurate or right. It's just that we have this very human centric way of thinking about these, you know, biological facts and we try to correct them. And, you know, we publish articles about, um, you know, this more modern view of thinking about the world and we're still stuck in this very anthropocentric perspective. Um, so, uh, That's the biology of fishes. Now thinking about the psychology of fishes, fish facts. Um, we can also actually go back to Darwin. So Darwin didn't just think about the evolution of form, biological form. He also was uh, uh, talked about and thought deeply about the um, continuity of experience. So he didn't just see that there was like these gradations of form. He also saw that there was gradations of experience and continuity there as well. And he talked about um, psychological um, experiences of all of the animals that he uh, uh, discussed and researched. Um, so this sort of plays into the um, fish's first fish welfare that I'll talk about later. So I'll just, uh, you know, give you a quick tour. And with all of this also, I'm sort of glossing over a lot, like the fish pain debate, for example. Um, I'm very, very happy to talk more about these things uh, in questions. So I'm just sort of like giving you little breadcrumbs that you can follow up on in questions. Um, so what do we know about the psychology of fishes? We know that they have personalities, they have stable individual differences uh, over time. They, have, they form social bonds with a family, uh, with their kin, but also with non-kin. And they even form uh, interspecies stable social bonds, uh, much more so actually than what we see on land. On land, there's less sort of interspecies uh, stable social relationships, but in fish species across the board, there's lots and lots of instances where they have hunting partners that they always hunt with the same, like eels and groupers hunt together. And it will be like the same eel and the same grouper, they hang out together and they hunt together. Uh, cleaner wrasse on the reef have particular individual client fish who are regulars who they know and they behave differently towards the regulars than they do to the people who are the transients just passing through. Um, so they form these interspecies uh, relationships as well. Um, they have all, you know, full range of emotions, um, you know, evidence of, of positive, affective states, negative affective states. They have motivations, preferences, desires that we're now starting to measure uh, with more precision. They have actually very, very good memory, uh, learning abilities. One of my favorites is that there's actually evidence that they enjoy tactile stimulation. So I think that's something that we, uh, we value as humans and fish value it too. I think that's really cool curiosity, play, and even culture. So the extent to which you can think about culture as the behavioral transmission of, uh, uh, a, you know, learned ways of interacting with the world. So social learning, 
about patterns of behavior that get passed down through generations, fish have that. Many, many different species of fish. And so when I say fish have these things, of course, I'm doing that thing that I said we shouldn't do, which is sort of integrating across all of these diverse beings. But these are sort of like the basic principles that they all have and then the way they get expressed in different species is different depending on you know their particular way of being in the world. So that's just some background information about fish. So now I'd like to talk about some work that I'm doing with colleagues about aquaculture, which is the farming of fish. So this is a graph from FAO, which is the um, Food and Agricultural Organization arm of the United Nations. They track farming around the globe. Uh, when they're tracking terrestrial animals who are farmed, they track them as individuals. Uh, so one of the first things to notice here that when we're talking about fish being tracked, they're measured in tons. They're not measured as individuals. Um, so this is the first indication that we're treating fish categorically different in terms of our way of interfacing with them. Uh, again, with this sort of like inferior, lesser than uh, uh, perspective is, is playing out here as well. So what you have is fish utilization measured in tons over the you know, past half century or so. Um, and we have some uh, use of the food fish supply from catcher capture fisheries, so this is the hunting of the wild fishes. And you can see that that's increased, but not dramatically, and even recently has sort of started um, flatlining a bit. Um, and then we have, uh, in contrast to that, food fish supply from aquaculture, which has been increasing exponentially, to the point that now about half of the fish that we eat globally um, come from farming, not from the wild. And there's many reasons for that. Um, and so you have graphs like this and people say that this is a sign that aquaculture is like the food of the future and it's what we need to feed a hungry world. People making claims um, about that and the hype around that. Um, I wonder if as the host, you can do like a mute all thing just to, until we get to um, thank you. Um, okay, so there's this like hype around aquaculture and very impressive plots like this. Um, but of course, I'll unmute myself. Okay, um, so, so there's the hype around aquaculture. It's only part of the story though. Um, so there's some problems with this narrative. First of all, of course, is that it, um, it doesn't talk about all the costs. So there's rampant antibiotic overuse, habitat destruction, uh, feed supply issues. One of the problems with aquaculture is that the fish that we're farming are, a lot of them are carnivores and require protein input. And that protein is actually wild fish that we're catching in the oceans. There's human rights abuses with working conditions. There's disease spread, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so there's a lot of costs, but there's these two central points. One is that, th that aquaculture actually does not alleviate pressure on wild populations in part because of that feed supply issue. Um, so the most recent work looking at this is that it's not a replacement model, it's an addition model. So it's just, we're adding more to the system. We're not alleviating pressure on the oceans by any means by um, um, expanding aquaculture. And the other crucial point is that aquaculture in general, the vast majority of it does not go towards feeding a hungry world. It goes to mostly food secure markets. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, subsistence, Aquaculture, people who are doing it, and that is how they're getting the bulk of their food, is a minor, minor sliver compared to that huge uh, expansion that I showed on that previous plot. Um, but another thing that is hidden, of course, is the animal welfare issues. And so who is being obscured by this sort of hype in the story around aquaculture? But we already talked about how it's probably hundreds of billions of individuals, not just a certain tonnage. 
Um, but then there's also hundreds of species, a staggering diversity of lives are being affected. So if you think about terrestrial agriculture, there's maybe at most 20 different species that we're farming right now, and that's been stable for you know, thousands of years. In aquaculture, there's literally hundreds, orders of magnitude more species. And as I talked about before, the fact that there's all these different species that are being farmed is a real problem because they're not all the same. They're not one generic sort of fishy-like thing. They have radically different lives. So to try to think about that and why that's such a problem, I think it helps. One of the things that we realized as we were developing this work is that how crucial species specific knowledge is and we take it for granted with non-fish species so imagine that you didn't know anything about dogs and there's literally no information about what it means to give dogs a good life what it's like for a dog to be behaving well all of that knowledge is just missing because they're so we've never interacted with them before. This is what's happening in aquaculture. So in the absence of species specific knowledge, beyond you know, knowing what to do to provide a good life, you can't even identify if there's a problem. So one of the things that I've heard um, uh, in uh, one fish farmer say, for example, or a worker at a fish farming facility, is that um, you know, oh, the salmon, they eat each other's eyeballs. That's just what salmon do. I mean, maybe that's what salmon do but i don't think so but also if nobody's actually like bothered to check out how salmon behave under normal conditions there's no real way to push back on that especially as me like this you know new york city elite who has no experience around salmon and i'm telling people that that's not normal if i don't have any science to back that up it's going to be a hard uphill battle so we can't even identify problems and whatever is going on in the current systems becomes normalized. So that's a huge problem. We also have the inability to create welfare st standards, label certification schemes. We can't make them, we can't enforce them, and we can't um, assess them with science-based evidence. It's just, again, going on sort of like he said, she said kind of um, information. So even though the knowledge of welfare of a particular species is not going to guarantee that the animal has good welfare, the absence of the knowledge indicates a big risk. And that's probably true across the board for all animals, but it might even be more particularly true in aquaculture. Because we don't share an evolutionary history with them, they're undomesticated, they have radically different body plans, and they live in a radically different environment from ourselves, so we don't even get to have intuitive sense about what to do. We don't have traditional wisdom for the most part. Most species, there's a handful of species that have been farmed for thousands of years, but not the hundreds that we're doing right now. And so this is borne out by some recent work um, that evaluated um, uh, 41, I think it's more now, different species of fish uh, and their current aquaculture practices and concluded that um, for most species, the current conditions are extremely poor. So to try to quantify this a little bit more, what my colleagues and I did is we went to that FAO um, uh, website that has information tracking the tonnage. So they list species, I've put species in parentheses, I'll get back to why I did that in a second. And then we have the tonnage and the first thing that we need to do is calculate the number of individuals for each listing. So we did a back calculation based on uh, the estimated slaughter, weight at slaughter. And then that allowed us to calculate the number of individuals. So that's on the x-axis going, and it's on the logarithmic scale. So it's going from just 100 individuals in a particular species, and then on the far end of this, uh, the scale is in, in the billions now. So it, it ramps up quickly. Um, and then we went to the web of science and classified the animal welfare knowledge for each species that's listed. So hundreds of species. And we looked to the animal welfare knowledge, and we said, are now if we look on the vertical axis are there five or more publications for this species so there's a small body of work on their welfare little welfare just one to four publications no welfare and then this bottom category is the species that's unknown so a lot of the listings that fao produces says something like snappers not listed elsewhere so it's like there's a whole bunch of snapper species 
Some of them have been listed as the species in terms of the tonnage, and then a whole bunch of species have just kind of gotten lumped together and just generally identified as snappers. So then if we don't even know what the species is, we certainly can't have any species specific knowledge. So that's an even bigger problem. So we looked at invertebrates like crustaceans and uh, you know, shrimps and lobsters and bivalves and stuff like that. And you can see that there's a bunch that, of species. So remember these are species and then the number of individual and then how much welfare knowledge is. But what we're talking today is the invertebrates. So those are the bony fishes uh, that are being farmed. And so I'm just trying to move this thing if I can, because I can't see it. Okay, so with the vertebrates, so these are all those fish species, hundreds of fish species that are being farmed. There's a couple dozen that have a small body of literature on them. But there's just a huge, hundreds of different species that constitute billions of individuals where we don't know hardly anything about their welfare. So if we just focus in on this part of the graph, this is like there's one species per dot and each of those species are radically different from each other. They're not this generic fish, like we have to shake that generic fish notion that have different requirements to ensure their welfare. And there are literally billions of individuals with absolutely no coverage. And so just to drive this home a little bit more, just to take a really, to make it more concrete. So one species that we're farming, Atlantic salmon. They are born in rivers, in fresh water. They go, they um, make their way down through the river. They change their biology so that they're able to then go into marine environments. They spend a huge amount of time going on migrations, thousands of miles in the Atlantic Ocean, um, doing a whole different sort of things than they would be doing in the river. And they're, again, their biology is totally different at that point. Then they are able to make their way back to their natal river and go back into the fresh water. It would be like just breathing a totally different gas all of a sudden. I mean, it's just, it's a pretty remarkable thing that's happening. And then they go back into the freshwater, back to their natal river, exactly where they were born years and years and years ago. And they have massive spawning event and then they die. Um, and so it's just this, you know, that's the end of it. So that's salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon. And then on the right, we have Nile tilapia. Nile tilapia are freshwater, they live in, structured hierarchical stable societies with a breeding pair that bond for life. They engage in parental care. The female um, is what's known as a mouth brooder. So she, when after she, um, they have their offspring, the fry actually go into her mouth for a couple months and she stops eating uh, to protect them. And then as they're growing up, they start leaving her mouth. But if something frightening comes along, they go back into her mouth. And so there's just like, that's just wild in my opinion, but for them it's normal. So you can imagine that the, um, and, and they make nests and yes, they have this like stable social structure. So these are just, they're just two radically different ways of being. If we're gonna talk about their welfare, there's no sense in talking about their welfare as being just, oh, if I know about Nile tilapia welfare, obviously I'll know about Atlantic salmon welfare. I mean, it's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. And this is true for all of those hundreds of different species. Another um, totally crazy species that we're farming is Atlantic halibut. They might be more related, let's say, to the Atlantic salmon. They live in marine environments, but they live for 80 years. They grow up to be um, hundreds of pounds. They also go on massive migrations in the North Atlantic. Um, and they are bottom dwellers. They're living primarily in the darkness under intense high pressure. I mean, they just also are totally different. So this is just three examples, but you know, we could tell these stories about all of the hundred different species we're doing. So by thinking about fish in aquaculture, I think one of the problems is that we're defining them by their use rather than by who they are. And so this is where the fish's first welfare comes in. So I used to call this positive welfare and positive welfare is um, something that's gaining a lot of traction in the animal welfare world. It's an emerging approach. Um, 
the way that I have thought about and talked about positive welfare is that this is about centering the research on the individual animal's experience rather than the system. So understanding them for their own sake. Um, it is also about pleasure and feeling good, but it's not just about pleasure and feeling good. And so this is why I've started moving away from that because people have misunderstood this as like, you know, oh, you're just interested in pleasure and like, you know, happiness and all the good things. And it's way more complicated than that. So I've started moving away from this. So I meant, I mean positive in the sense of affirming the inherent value of the individual without respect to their human centric use. And um, one of the advantages with fish, because this practice is so new, we haven't gotten so entrenched with particular approaches to fish welfare as we have with certain forms of animal welfare, like with chicken welfare and dairy welfare. It's very, very well established um, how to approach it. With fish, we have this opportunity because it's so young, we can actually embrace this new, more sort of emerging, approach to thinking about welfare and in particular the reason this approach is becoming more popular is a recognition that the old approach to animal welfare wasn't really moving us as far as and, and wasn't satisfying the um, urgent needs of, of the day so sometimes i say positive welfare sometimes i say animal first i think i might start saying animal first more often now that's fish's first fish welfare. <laughs> um, so the idea is to put the interest, some, some people working on fish welfare, not everybody, but at least some people, some space should be made to put the interest of the fishes first and not adopt a compromise position. So like a general basic negotiation strategy is you come to the table with your aspirational goals rather than what you think the other party is actually going to grant you. And so if you begin with this compromise position and trying to figure out what the other side wants, uh, you are probably just gonna get pushed or pulled further in their direction. So I think there is some value in actually just saying, no, I will represent the interest of the fishes and then we can talk about the compromises that need to be made going forward for the other interested parties that are involved, like people who are currently involved in farming fish, people who are eating fish, people, blah, blah, blah. But some people I believe need to be representing the interest of the fishes first, period. So part of adopting this approach is like envisioning structural transitions. So thinking about system change um, and thinking about incentivizing low welfare risk cultivation, cultivation like with seaweeds and bivalves, so that's like oysters and clams, and de-investing, divesting from high welfare risk. Um, cultivation. So octopus, for example, there's pushes to uh, cultivate octopus and farm octopus and uh, my colleagues and I have written about why we believe that's a, not a great way forward for various reasons, including welfare. There also is a recognition that welfare is more than just optimal biological function. Biological, good biological function is great, it's core, it's necessary, but you can't stop there. And if you have a very system-based approach, there's a tendency to conflate optimizing the system with welfare. So you say, oh, the fish are growing really well and they're not dying. And that's great for my production and it's great for fish welfare. Yes, but fish welfare also involves psychological health and engaging in ecologically relevant behaviors. Um, so we need more than just this biological optimization. So just an example of this, this production oriented approach to welfare, one of the papers that actually got counted as a welfare paper because we said if they said it was welfare, I'm not gonna split hairs. They just use the wel word welfare essentially, basically it gets counted as a welfare paper. This was one of the papers that got counted as a welfare paper and this is not an outlier, this is pretty common. So the effects of carbon dioxide stunning method on rigor mortis development, clay quality and oxidative, um, I can't read that last word because my thing is covering it up, but basically this is about slaughter methods that maybe could improve welfare, but really the point is fillet quality, which is fine. That's the point of their research, but we just also need a broader conception of, re uh, of welfare if we're gonna be talking about you know, fish of like interests. 
And then I think the last component is understanding the fishes for their own sake in naturalistic settings, their um, complete behavioral repertoire, full emotional range, complex motivations and cognitions. And I like to think of that as sort of like the fish sanctuary approach where in complement to the within system research, also doing research where it's literally the fish come first, we're taking care of them, we're trying to learn about them so that we can gain this baseline information. So this is, I think, my last slide, and then I'll open it up for questions. So the added value of this fish sanctuary, fish is first, fish welfare. Um, so can answer and encompass traditional approaches. So thinking about things that can be implemented in this, the system and that can give us ideas about practical solutions. Because if you have a sort of myopic focus on biological function, you can miss things about the experiential level, like a fish's preference for what color the tank is, or a fish's preference to control their own feeding schedule that is getting more into the psychology of the fish. Um, and you know, you're essentially, by getting into that psychological uh, uh, perspective on fish and thinking about what they would do if they could do what they wanted to do, uh, it can actually even yield practical within system solutions. So it's not at the expense of that. Everyone needs positive experiences. So this is back to this positive, you know, welfare kind of notion just to have a normal life. So one of the problems in traditional welfare approaches is thinking like this progression, uh, progressive, re progressive removal of harms is what the, you know, is what the, the goal is. But just imagine your life with zero positive experiences. That's not going to be a, a decent life. That's not a normal life. It's, it's a bad life. So even though we have this positive experience notion uh, as being something like extra, more than, you know, a luxury, we'll get to it once we get that other negative stuff sorted and gotten rid of, uh, positive experiences are core to just a normal life. And they actually serve to counteract the negative things that happen. So it's not just about removing negative, it's about adding in positive so that you end up with something closer to normal. So we need to understand the positive experiences. We need to have this baseline information about uh, species that we're going to pursue cultivation. And I think that one of the things that we really need to understand is the full scope of what is lost by putting them into these production systems in the first place. So, you know, are there um, behavioral traditions that are passed down through generations? Do they have uh, you know, uh, personalities that they can develop uh, rather than sort of when you put animals in really stressed out uh, environments, barren, you know, uh, difficult environments, they lose their individuation. So you lose your personality. They aren't able to form stable social bonds. So if we just study them in the system, we wouldn't even be able to detect their personalities, their social bonds, their cognitive potential, their desire for autonomy and to engage in play and curiosity and all that kind of stuff. So we don't have a good gauge of what is lost. Um, and then I think the other thing is all of these questions circle around this issue about why we should care about fish in the first place. Like why should we care about their welfare? It's because they have the potential for forming long lasting social bonds for having a you know, rich cognitive experience for engaging in play and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where, again, this comes back to questioning the wisdom of the system itself. It's not just like, oh, no stakes, nothing matters endeavor. Maybe we should think about, again, re, re investing, changing the investment patterns, getting people to transition to more welfare friendly species because the species that we are trying to farm have these rich lives that are being uh, constrained by the current system. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much for um, your attention and for having me. And uh, I'd love to hear any questions anyone has. Thank you so much, Becca. I learned a lot there. That was really, really interesting. And you crowned a lot into a relatively short uh, presentation so thank you all so much and um, 
for the great questions and thank you Becca for, for the great presentation. Um, we have some really interesting questions here. I think I'll just start um, in chronological order with them. So the first one is about stocking density and it's specific to tilapia and it's specific to this, this person's experience. They're actually uh, um, calling in from Ireland where I'm originally from, so that's very nice. Um, and so this person did an internship in a research facility working with tilapia and uh, the tilapia were being stocked very densely with only a third of the fish being sampled at the end of the trial. Um, she was saying it felt like a terrible waste of life, but the argument was that this density allowed them to form a stable social hierarchy and that the lower densities had higher incidences of cannibalism and aggression. So they're wondering, you know, from your point of view, is there a balance to be struck here or, you know, can or how can, if at all, this species be managed on a farm? Yeah, this is a great point and a, a really great question. So, so one of the things that we tend to think, we, it's much easier to think linearly. And by that, I mean, you know, you would imagine that you have lowest possible stocking density, just two Nile tilapia going about their business. Then you go up to highest stocking density where you're just packed in. And is it is it the case that it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse? Or is it the case that it gets better and better and better and better and better? And so that's that's linear thinking. And I mean, you know, it's it's just the way that we're wired to think about the world. And in fact, what we find is that almost none of these parameters are linear. So what you can get is that you get uh, some something like a phase change almost that happens where you can go from these small, stable, close-knit, essentially families, as they might be in the wild, and then as they get into these production systems at low stocking density, it kind of goes haywire. But then as you get into higher stocking densities, everybody's just like, all we can do is just swim in a circle. There's no other option. So that's what we're gonna do and stop bothering each other and fighting over space. And then you get into higher stocking densities and then you know it's actually a problem because there's not enough water for the fish to be there's like too much fish per water so so there's 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 a sense in which given a production system it's quite possible and and you see it a lot um with fish uh where higher stocking densities or something that's moderate is actually better than super low stocking densities uh there's various reasons for that but so so there's if you're committed to a system and the system is first and you're interested in that system, then it's important to look at the range of possibilities within your system. Uh, and I think that that is totally valid and useful animal welfare research. And then the fish's first fish welfare would be looking outside the system and just seeing what, you know, what their natural behavior would be like in the wild, what kind of stable social hierarchies they form, and that it's not because it's going to translate directly into being like, see, look there, you have to have low stocking densities. It's going to be more providing different sorts of qualities of information because something changes. This happens across the board, like termites do this, where they're like totally chaotic if there's just like three termites, but you put a bunch of termites together and all of a sudden there's like this emergent thing that happens and they build these elaborate cathedral-like structures. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, there's another couple of questions which I think segue well from, from that one, Becca, um, around, um, you know, since you're saying some species are particularly unsuited uh, to being farmed, um, and we can get to the question of that somebody else raised her and why are we farming them at all later, but um, this question was, around, was from Val and it was about, you know, do we have research, you know, that's compelling enough from your point of view that either confirms or refutes that uh, bivalves uh, feel pain. And I think I'll, I'll mush this in with Lucas' question, which is related, um, which is basically Lucas is saying there's more efforts being spent into kickstarting commercial low trophic um, animals, so bivalves and sea urchins and so on. And so Lucas is saying oh, there's, you know, maybe less certainty about whether they feel pain and should we still be concerned for their potential psychological well-being or lack of freedom to move and perform other natural behaviors for the, the morel species? So I'll kind of pose that question, um, pose those questions together. Like, what is your, your thoughts about the evidence for those kinds of animals um, feeling pain? 
and do you think a move towards farming them is, is problematic? Yeah, that's uh, it's really important questions. Um, so basically, there is now more and more evidence coming out that they do seem to have like they get distracted when they're distressed, which sounds weird because they're like, you know, they basically don't have, they don't have a brain, but um, you know, so bivalves, just to be clear, oysters, clams, mussels, um, but like the, their normal behavior, let's say is to close at a certain speed when a threat comes, but if they're like in pain, let's say, or uh, distracted by some, uh, uh, stimuli that could be pain uh, that isn't actually interfering with their biological function of closing, they don't close as well, which is one of the things, the primary things that we see as evidence of pain is that you, you engage in decision making, you engage in uh, coping with your environment differently under duress than uh, under normal conditions. So we are starting to see evidence of that. Um, I'm, you know, I think Pain is definitely something to be concerned about. I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more concerned about the bigger picture, which is like the full, you know, experiential uh, uh, existence of, of the animal rather than just the narrow slice of pain. Again, for this reason of like, you know, this complete, getting a complete picture. And so other things that we're finding out about bivalves and clams and mussels is that they um, get stressed out by loud noises. Uh, you know, so, so, it seems like there's reason to attend to more than just their biological function. Um, that said, you know, providing them with a decent life uh, and, you know, attending to the full scope of uh, what would constitute clan welfare. Um, and by the way, they move around. They do actually move around. We think of them as being completely sessile, but they're not like, a, they move around in all kinds of different ways. That's just slow. <laughs> and uh, uh, basically, so if there was something like clam welfare, you know, we should just take this full blown approach to clam welfare and think, you know, because if they're getting stressed out by noise pollution, you know, that's potentially a moral problem. It could also be a problem for production, smart production. You're not going to have them growing as well. Um, so I think that, but I think in general, the things that we would need to do to create sort of an acceptable level of welfare would be, the bar would be a lot, it would be easier to do potentially. Um, so I think that it's worth thinking about for many different reasons. Um, but that it's probably, my guess is that it might be easier, but I don't know. I mean, maybe they're so different from us, it's harder. I don't know. Thank you, Becca. Um, I think that addressed um, some of the kind of uh, questions that a, a few people had asked. Um, so there was another question here, which is kind of a little bit more about um, your kind of professional life uh, generally. So uh, this one was from Elizabeth uh, from Facebook and um, she said, thanks for your thought provoking talk. Um, she wanted to ask you how your work has been received by more quote, like traditional scholars in your field and what strategies have you developed to gain more traction among scholars who define fishes by their quote uses. And she's saying this as a sociologist who has done some human animal studies work and has been look like, uh, looked at like she had two heads. So interested in your thoughts about kind of navigating that. Um, well, you know, okay, for, for the scientists, at least, I mean, okay, so it's not easy, first of all, but, um, but I think that, you know, uh, with the scientist community, there's two things that I do. One is that there is this basic knowledge gap. And scientists really love basic knowledge that sort of like floats in space and has no utility in the world. And so you can like sort of, I've pushed the idea that like, this is like really basic science. Like we're discovering fundamental things about the world and, and that's why we need to do this. Um, and then another thing with, well, so this is more particularly the laboratory science. So, so just thinking about how, how it interfaces with, um, you know, their goals of having like reproducible research and all that kind of stuff. 
So, but within the context of, of what we're talking about today, the farming context, I would say that talking about how this, th there is this massive blind spot that we have right now and especially in fish welfare it's there to some degree in animal welfare writ large but like it's in particular in fish welfare where everything is being defined as biological function and it's leading to um that's not what that's not what it is to be an animal and you're you're ignoring a huge part of what it is to be an animal and it's detrimental to your own goals so one of the things that we heard about um, at a conference last summer was, a, I think it was a perch farmer. I don't remember the species, so forgive me, but um, you know, they were manually extracting the eggs from the females to then be fertilized by the males and they couldn't get them to spawn. And they just went this like very mechanical approach to production. And then, somebody at some point came across some piece of information somewhere about how they vocalize to each other. The males vocalize to the females as part of their mating ritual. And so they're like, well, maybe we should let them, you know, make their fishy vocalizations to each other. And they did that and it solved the, the um, reproduction problem. That's what was missing, is allowing the males to vocalize to the females that then induces them to release their eggs, which then the males fertilize. So you are investing all of this production effort into like hiring people. It's Extracting eggs is like the worst for everyone involved, especially the female fish. There's a huge amount of loss of life, like you're losing your fish because they don't take well to having their eggs extracted. So it's just like this thing that is not even working for the system. Um, because there's this blind spot to the fact that they have a certain way of being in the world and they have certain behaviors that they engage in. So there's like these production answers that we're missing as well. And it, you know, it's just not a smart approach. So. I know we're right at time, but there's so many questions that I'll, I'll squeeze in uh, at least another um one or two and so um i wanted to raise this one with you which i thought was really um actually you know what i'm going to leave that one to last because it's a more positive question I'll, I'll ask this one um briefly here which is kind of about you know stunning and slaughter methods and just interested in your your thoughts generally about where we're at with that um this Dude, shut the fuck up <laughs> oh wow okay um that's interesting um <laughs> Um, so they get slaughter methods that got me off track. Yeah, so we you know where you're thinking with that They were saying should we be banning things outright? Is that a better strategy like banning ice um, slurry techniques or should we be really pushing for species specific um, stunning and slaughter requirements, so just interested in your thoughts on that and I will add uh, one more kind of more positive question at the end So we don't add, we don't end on that downer Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know that much about slaughter methods because it's not in my, you know, wheelhouse, horse, whatever it's called, um, you know, because I'm more interested in the fish and the slaughters about killing them. Um, it's, a, of course, a huge concern. It's just I don't, I don't personally, uh, it's not my expertise. That said, fish slur um, ice slurries are just generally quite awful especially for um, fish who tend to live in cold water because they actually are adapted to live a really long time and on ice and in very very cold water there's some species that even can live below freezing um, so you're essentially just giving them this incredibly protracted uh, time of suffering and it's not fast it's easy for the humans but it's very difficult for the fish um so yeah i think that there's some things that seem like across the board probably would just be worth putting behind us then there's other things that are definitely species specific uh, in terms of different you know um gassing methods some and and uh, toxins that you can put into what some fish seem to really have a strong aversion to one form and not another form so then it does again become species specific that's really helpful becca thank you oh my dog is very excited about that too max elder had a really interesting question here which was about um what have you changed your mind about most recently related to the fish pain 
debate slash wel fish welfare debate generally. Hi, Max. Um, <laughs> uh, what have I changed my mind about? Uh, in terms of the fish pain debate, oh, I mean, I don't want to say nothing, but it's kind of nothing. Like, I just... I just think it's just so preposterous and that, that, that this is a question. And I think, I guess what I've changed my mind about is thinking more carefully about how entrenched this notion of primitiveness. You know, there's like a book called Your Inner Fish. You know, like we just think they're like sub, sub us. This like terrible, you know, destructive, idea of human supremacy uh, and how how pervasive that is and how difficult it is to shake. So I have it in my own head. I don't want to have it there, but it's just a, it's, it's this clamorous environment that we're living in that um, makes us think that way. And so it's really hard to shake. So even just this notion that like fish are not our, our grandparents, they're just, they're not. Like that's just such a silly way to think about it, but it gets presented over and, and that just occurred to me. So I think that that misconception, that fundamental misconception, they're different than us, they're unfamiliar to us, is not lesser than. That's what sets the stage for this pain debate to, I think, persist. And so, um, so one of the things that I, I guess have doubled down on more than changed my mind about is that it's, I don't wanna let people set the debate you know, like playing on their field, on their turf. And I think that they're, you know, it's, it's fine. We can have arguments about pain and what pain means and, you know, whatever. But at some point, uh, you're just not going to convince people. And uh, we need to get on in understanding the fish. And they live much, much richer lives. And like, I'm just, uh, so, so the positive note is just like how lucky is it that there's all of these crazy species doing all kinds of like weird ways of being in the world? It's such a rich, wonderful world. And like, let's celebrate that and stop talking about pain. I love that. I love that we have a positive note to end on. And, um, you know, I think any one of these questions are so rich and nuanced. They could be a whole discussion. And so we would love to have you, of course, again, uh, Becca, come and speak to us sometime soon. Um, I'll do 10 hours next time. 10 hours, 10 hour event. Yeah, exactly. No breaks. Yeah, <laughs> straight through. A lot of Red Bull. Um, one final question I will ask, which I've been asking all the attendees, which is a little bit corny, but given how heavy a lot of this material can be, um, I have been asking folks if they have a favorite aquatic animal or fish. So your wow. life favorites for one day. Okay, yeah, I'll have I'll have my favorite. So there's a a, a species, a, a group. I think it's a family. I don't know. Anyway, there's many different species, but they're called parrotfish. They're on reefs, and they are just well. First of all, they're just amazing. But they color change like octopuses do. Like they can go from I'm blue and I'm like like blending in with the background, and then they swim by the reef and they're like now I'm brown and spotty, and then they swim away from the like just instant color change, crazy crazy, like ability that just blows my mind. And different colors, different shapes in terms of their, you know, like they can go from like being spotted to not being spotted. Uh, and it's just like, why aren't we talking about how cool that is? And then the other thing that they do is at night, sometimes they make themselves a mucus nest that is transparent. And it's this like mucusy bubble that they sleep in to stop parasites from getting on them. And if you look this up, it's just like, there, it's just, I don't even know what to, it's just like the most delightful thing. Cause there's this like fish, like floating around in a mucus bubble <laughs> and sleeping. It's just, it's great. It's just great. Well, that, I mean, I don't think we can top that. Let's just end with the mucus bubble there. And uh, thank you so much, Becca. And I uh, thanks for, for Mark and some other folks for uh, posting ALI's website in the, in the chat. You know, feel free to get in touch with us at ALI at ALI.fish or to get in touch with me directly at Rebecca at ALI.fish if you're interested in getting more involved with us and uh, really hope that Becca will come and speak to us again. This was a really, really great presentation. Thank you so much, Becca. 
thank you all. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for coming. Really appreciate it.